Miracle on Maple Hill, Chapter 4, The First Miracle. Some years now, Mr. Chris said, are real good for sap, and some are not. This year, the run started on the 19th of February. That's early. There was a big first run. What it takes is cold nights, freezing nights, and warmer days. Nobody knows why that combination brings the sap up, but it does. Mother and Daddy and Mr. and Mrs. Chris sat around the end of the stove, just lounging around like people by a picnic fire. Mr. Chris told Marley the stove wasn't called by that name, but was an evaporator because it boiled the water out of the sap and left syrup behind. You can pump oil out of the ground and water too, but sap can't pump sap. It either decides to come up or it doesn't. Marley stood by the side of the huge pans. You could look forever and forever into the bubbling deeper and deeper, but your looking was always coming up again. She tried watching one bubble all by itself, but she couldn't. It was gone. And another one was in its place too quickly. It was like 10,000 pots of taffy boiling all at once. The sap in the pans at the back looked like water, just as it did in the buckets on the trees. But each pan near the front was more and more golden because each one was closer to becoming real syrup. Mr. Chris said he had to boil away 40 gallons of sap to make one little gallon of syrup. How many gallons will one tree give, Daddy asked, and Marley knew why he wanted to know. On Maple Hill, there were about 50 maple trees. She could practically see Daddy's arithmetic getting ready to start working. Average tree will give 20 gallons in a season, Mr. Chris said. That's usually a half a gallon of syrup. Some seasons, sap seems to be sweeter to start with, and it won't take so much, but there are trees. Mr. Chris leaned forward as if he were telling a wonderful secret. I've got one old tree up by the pasture fence that we hang six buckets on. That tree is five feet through, and I've known it to give us over 240 gallons of sap in one season. He looked proud about what that old tree could do, Marley thought. I figure it must be over 200 years old now, he said and laughed. But for a maple tree, that's young yet. Plenty of sap left for another hundred years. Mrs. Chris laughed. That tree is Chris's pet, she said. I declare, he goes out and pinches off its worms. Mr. Chris opened the stove doors again and began shoveling in more logs. Here, let me help with that, Daddy said. He picked up a good-sized one and shoved it in. When that tree dies, Mr. Chris said, still thinking of his pet, it'll provide logs for another whole season of sugaring. Now that's being of some use in the world, isn't it? If a man could be as useful as that, he kicked the door shut again with his big foot. Suddenly, as the heat rose from the logs, the sap in the pans began to rise faster. Bubbles rose like magic, Faster and faster, and Marley stood back with a cry. It's going to boil over, she cried. Every single pan was suddenly high, great waves rolling at the edges. Chris laughed and reached over his head where a bucket swung from the rafters by a rope. Now I'll show you a magic trick, he said. In the bucket was a little bottle full of something white. It had a stick in it. Mr. Chris took the stick from the bottle 
and waved it over the pans, and Marley stared, and Joe gave a surprised whoop. Really, like magic, the bubbles fell away as the stick passed over. Why is it magic, Marley cried. Daddy laughed. Cream, Chris, he asked. I know, Joe said. I read about that in science. It's the fat breaking the surface tension. Now, surface tension is when the molecules of something get really close together so that um, you could almost like uh, put something on the top of a liquid and it won't sink in. I think y'all have probably done this with a paper clip a long time ago, but what happens when the fat kind of touches that surface tension, that fat breaks those molecules apart, and when they're broken apart, the boiling will die down, and the surface tension dies down as well. So let's go back to reading, um, if I can find it. Uh, Mr. Chris said, kids are too smart nowadays. They don't believe in magic anymore, except Marley. Everybody smiled, and he reached out and gave her a little hug. She still stood looking at the fallen bubbles and then at the bottle and the stick in Mr. Chris's hand. Well, even if it's like Joe said, it's magic all the same, isn't it? She asked. They all laughed, and then Joe said, Do you know what she said today? That a mouse was as important as a buffalo. She did. Mr. Chris glanced at Marley as he put the cream back into the bucket. I don't know, but what she was right if she was speaking of what's the biggest bother. See this bucket, Marley? I have to keep it hanging up on that rope for the cream to be set in. If I didn't, every time... I turn my back on the mice in this place, drain the bottle dry. I'm surprised you don't let them have it, Mrs. Chris said. I come out and find him playing with those mice. And do you know what he said when squirrels ate all the walnuts from our tree? Let him have the nuts and I'll buy him another sack for Christmas. He's the same with those mice. They'd not think that cream was for them if he had never given them any. So what does this tell you about Mr. Chris? What does it tell you about the kind of man that he is, about his character? Now, character are those things that you can't really see on the outside, but it's that in, those intrinsic, intrinsic things inside of you that kind of make you who you are, and they help guide the decisions that you make. I think it tells me that Mr. Chris is a very kind-hearted man. Takes care of the mice by giving them some of his cream. Feeds the squirrels when they get all the walnuts. He's always been very kind to Marley and Joe and to Lee. I'm thinking that could be a very good, that he could be very kind um, at his core. So let's continue reading. Well, Mr. Chris said while everybody laughed, the sugar house is a good place for mice to live in the winter time. They got to live, hadn't they? Same as we do. Marley was gazing up into Mr. Chris's face. You never set traps for mice, do you? She asked. Or put their little babies in the fire. Now, Marley, Mother said. But Marley paid no attention. You wouldn't, would you? She asked Mr. Chris. Why, no, Mr. Chris said. They're right friendly little things. There's a dear mouse that comes every day. Cute as a button with white feet and huge ears. Looks like a donkey with those ears. He and I are great friends. When I'm here alone, hours and hours... Lots of things happen. He winked at Marley and glanced at Mrs. Chris. My wife doesn't know all about my fu fur funny friends, he said. 
Have you ever seen a mouse with a thousand babies? Marley asked. Mr. Chris looked amazed and shook his head. Joe said quickly, his face going pinker and pinker, that was a meadow mouse, Marley. I read it in a book. There were mouse all over that place. We've got to get rid of some, Mother said. But for Marley, every spider, every creature has to live. And we're going to stop here for just a minute. And I'm wondering if she and Mr. Chris kind of have a, the same heart for those things that can't necessarily take care of themselves in a human world. Let's continue reading. There was a little silence. Then Mr. Chris said soberly, well, feeling like that won't ever do her any harm. Except they'll, she'll have to cry more than she needs to, Daddy spoke suddenly and reached out and took Marley onto his knee. Marley looked at him in surprise and so did Mother. And so did Joe. Now I wonder why Joe said she was going to have to cry more than she needed to. I wonder... If that's because of the emotional attachment that we get to animals. And then, of course, when they do pass away, we're very grieved. I, of course, would cry then, too. Hmm, I wonder if that's what he's talking about. Well, it's time to test this batch, Mr. Chris said, and took a wooden paddle from a hook on the wall. Then everybody here gets a taste except Marley. She gets two tastes for being good to mice. He dipped the paddle into the last pan and let the syrup run slowly off. Does it spin a web when it's done like candy, Mother asked? Not quite. It sheets off like that. The last syrup hung over the edge of the paddle and a great double drop came slowly down. Some folks use a thermometer, Mr. Chris said, but I like being able to, to tell or, um, I'm going to ask you this question. What do you think he means by that word tell as it's used in that sentence? Does he mean to explain something or is he meaning another definition for tell in his statement? But I like being able to tell. If you start using machinery for everything, you get so you don't just don't know anymore, it seems to me. I've been doing this for 40 years, ever since I had to boil in a kettle on the stone fireplace I built out yonder there in the trees. I figure I should be able to tell without any help now. Like the trees know when it's time to send up the sap. Now look at that. Perfect. 11 pounds to the gallon, or I'm a mighty poor judge. He turned a little spigot at the end of the pan, and the syrup began to run out into a big five-gallon can. It was a golden stream in the lamplight. Over the can, a cloth had been tied for the syrup to strain through. Here, Marley, dip some in this cup and set it out in the snow to cool, Mr. Chris said. Here, Joe, here's some for you. Marley carried her tin cup carefully, reverently, and set it in a bank of snow. The syrup was so hot that before she got it set down, the handle hurt her fingers. Joe set his on another bank of snow, and they stood waiting. We can boil a little down in the house for a while and then pour it on the snow and make sugar wax, Mrs. Chris said, following them. I used to think wax was the best treat in the world. Folks around here used to serve it at sugar and off parties during the season. She showed them how the hot syrup went suddenly sticky in the snow and how they could take a stick and make an all-day sucker by poking it in and twisting it around. Then the taste. It was like the smell, but stronger, sweeter, firmer. 
Now, again, I'm wondering what that word firmer means. Is, um, is it meaning harder or is it meaning like more potent? I wonder which one that word firmer means in that sentence. Take some syrup home and have pancakes in the morning, Mr. Chris said. Did you bring the makings, Lee? Of course, Mother said, and a can of syrup from the grocery store in Pittsburgh. How awful, Mrs. Chris said. Everybody laughed. Marley put her finger into the cup and it was cool enough. She sat on the pile of wood in front of the fire and sipped. The syrup was better than the wax, she thought. The taste came through her nose, too, in a funny way. Do you like it, Mr. Chris asked. Before you got the smell of spring, Marley, now you've got the taste. The sap is the first miracle that happens every spring. After all winter, with everything shut tight, all of a sudden, the trees are alive again. That is a miracle, Marley said, even in the park down home every year. Joe looked a little embarrassed the way he might if somebody started to recite a poem. The sap running gives me a feeling I can't describe, Mr. Chris said, like it's the blood of the earth moving. Everybody sat, as, sat still as if they might be in church and Mr. Chris was given the sermon, but it was different from church. With Mother and Daddy and Chrissy sitting on an old beat-up couch, Mr. Chris sat in one corner, and Marley and Joe and Mr. Chris perched on the pile of wood. Fritz sat on a turned-over bucket. His boots stuck out in front of him. The fire spit and the sap boiled, and the drowsy heat and wavery lantern light and steamy smell were wonderful. Little fine drops fell sometimes from the ceiling. Um, friends, can you see that in your mind? Can you, can you see them all sitting around that big evaporator when you've got your eyes closed? Can you see Fritz sitting on a bucket that's turned over and he's got his legs sticking out in front of him? Maybe he's got his feet crossed. That is absolutely visualizing um, figurative language. You can see it in your mind. Let's go back to reading. I wish somebody would sing a song, Mrs. Chris said. Used to be we'd sit around the sugar fire and sing and sing. Like in summer at our picnics, Mother said. Didn't you tell me, Dale sang, when you were first engaged, Lee, I remember you said how beautiful his voice was. Oh, she thought everything about me was beautiful then, Daddy said, and laughed. Your voice is wonderful, Dale, Mother said, not laughing at all. Was, maybe, he said, and to Chrissy, I, I'm afraid I don't sing anymore. Now, I wonder, again, if all of the trauma that he went through when he was a prisoner of war, if that's maybe why he doesn't sing anymore. Hmm. Let's read on and see if we can find out. Why not? Mr. Chris asked in a big, boomy voice. Nobody who can sing should ever give it up. Not many folks can sing. I always said if I could so much as carry a tune in a sap bucket, I'd never give folks any rest. Y'all, that's like Mrs. Byers. I can't sing. All my buckets got holes in them. One song, Dale. These are old friends, Mother said. Her voice asked him hard, not telling him he had to sing, but just asking in a nice way. Marley held her breath. She could remember Daddy singing, but it was a long time ago, before he went away, when she went to bed at night. That old one about the fox, that ballad would be nice, Mother said. The children used to love that. I don't think I can remember all the verses, 
Maybe I can help you out then, Mother said, and everybody can sing the last lines together. The ones about the town, oh. For a minute, Daddy sat looking tight all over. Then he stood up, put his head back, and looked up at the rolling steam. His voice was little at first, but it seemed to get bigger and bigger. Okay, y'all, Mrs. Byers is going to sing this so y'all don't make fun of me. Oh, the fox went out one winter's night and he prayed to the moon to give him light. It was a wonderful story song. The kind Marley thought was the best of all. The fox took the fat duck home to his wife and babies and the farmer was too late to prevent it. Daddy's voice got nicer with every verse, and at the end of every one, the sugar house was as full of singing as it was of steam. Mr. Chris was a little bit out of tune, but it didn't matter. When the song ended, everybody clapped and clapped, and Joe said, Dad, you know another one about a fox? I remember you singing it about some hunters who asked the boy where the fox went and he wouldn't tell them. And the fox was tired and Marley began. That one's too fast until I practice. I'll sing it when you come back, Daddy said. I'll practice every night. He looked at Mother and she smiled. and Everything felt good in a way that Marley had almost forgotten. I wonder if Marley is thinking about how good things felt before Daddy went away as a soldier and to be a prisoner of war and, and became a prisoner of war and that things are beginning to kind of maybe feel like that again. Hmm. Well, you sure can carry a tune, Fritz said with admiration. Mother jumped up and said it was getting late, and Marley looked as if she was going to fall off her perch any minute. So they all walked out to the truck together. Mother and Chrissy and Marley walking last and looking back at the shining door. This is so beautiful, Chrissy, Mother said. How you must love sugar season. Marley jumped when Chrissy answered because the way she spoke didn't sound like Mrs. Chris at all. Her voice was low and tight, a lot like Daddy's when he was cross and tired. Love it. I hate it, Chrissy said. Marley could hardly believe her ears. He works too hard. You should be able to see that, Lee. Two years ago, he had a heart attack just before the end of the season. But nothing can stop him. Nothing. Do you think he'll take care of himself while there's work to do? Her voice actually trembled. But they came to the truck where the men were talking and laughing together. And she said no more. Marley felt wide awake again. Marley, Mr. Chris said, boosting her on to the truck. Your father says when school's out, you're coming up for the whole summer. You and I'll do some looking around. What do you say? I'll introduce you to every mouse I know and every bird and trees and flowers. Why, you hadn't seen anything around here yet. That'll be wonderful, she said. So she could go with him, she thought, and it wouldn't matter whether Joe would take her or not. You know what I'll promise you, Mr. Chris asked. Every weekend you come until school's out, I promise you at least one new miracle. All right, she cried. The engine of the truck began to roar. Good night, good night. The wide fields blinked under a moon. The woods looked dark and scary on the edges, but 
Then there was a light and another light. The next light is ours, Joe said. As they went into the house, Daddy began to sing again without either being asked or told. He just suddenly started to sing that old song that starts. Be it ever so humble. That's the miracle for this week, Dad, Marley thought. It was better than the sugar house or the magic trick. She thought about it as she fell asleep in the very old bed where Mother had slept when she was a little girl. <laughs>